All right, welcome back to our Sports Biz Network Virtual Summit. I'm really excited about this one. We've got some great startup companies, a little bit different than what we've been talking about here throughout the summit. So I'll have each, each person explain their company, uh, what it is, who they are, and why the hell we need their company in this world. Trey, you were on first, so go ahead and talk to us about Jimble. Oh, wow, Hasi, Hasi. Well, first of all, thanks for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity to connect and you know, tell a little bit about the brand. It's always just a super awesome experience for me. So yeah, my name is Trey Phils, um, Yale graduate, class of 2019. And shortly after graduation in the fall of 2019, I started the idea for what is Jimble today. And the easiest way to explain it and what I usually tell people just so they understand the concept is it's like an Airbnb for athletic spaces, right? So if you're a youth sports program, if you're a trainer, if you're a mom of, of if you're a soccer mom or something like that, this app will help you get connected with the spaces in your area that you might not know about. And it came up because, um, so my first year um, outside of college, I was playing in the NBA G League and I had just gotten waived by the Chicago Bulls organization. So I was back home and I was training, trying to find spaces to, uh, you know, stay sharp and get ready to get picked back up again. And I was like, why does, why am I having such a hard time just finding gyms to rent or, you know, finding just any types of facilities. So that's kind of where it started and it's grown today to um, a team of three and we have seven facilities from the Charlotte, North Carolina area on board. And, you know, why should, why should you care about it? You know, well, you guys are all, you know, athletic backgrounds and you understand sports um, and all of you probably played youth sports. You know how hard it is to sometimes find consistent practice spaces, you know, whether it's AAU club volleyball and even thinking um, beyond just, you know, youth sports, Let's say you're a mom and you want to have a soccer birthday party for your kid. This is an app that will help you do so. So I think it's um, super innovative. Nothing like it has really existed. A lot of people think we're just trying to facilitate pickup games. And I just wanted to spell that we're more than just a pickup app. It's kind of just, you know, all sports, every facility. And I think the, you know, the potential is endless and we should care lastly, just because it's a scalable business. And I think that's kind of like the future of how we should be thinking about businesses and tech and, you know, athletics is kind of the last space to get fully on the tech um, side of things. So I'm just happy to, you know, build and, you know, take baby steps. So. And you're just launching like your brand. Yes, new. We're, uh, you said what? You're brand new. Right. Brand new. We're, um, we're launching June 26th. So been pretty busy these last couple of weeks. <laughs> You were telling me your schedule beforehand. You're like two hour meeting here. I got a mixed in practice and yada, yada. So I get all that stuff. And when we yeah. first came out before we started recording, the guys, well, actually, I don't know where you guys are now, but Brian and Thomas were like, and actually it was Brian said it. Brian goes, wait, are you T Phil's? <laughs> and they were talking about somebody connecting with you. And that's why we love this type of stuff. But from space to something you can put in a space, Brian and Thomas talked to us about what you do and your product and why the hell we need it. Sure. Sure. Um, well, so we're grind basketball. Um, in a nutshell, we're trying to revolutionize the way that athletes train. Uh, we're trying to bring access to products that will help them reach the next level and, and ultimately achieve their goals. Um, so, you know, number one, we're leading off with the world's first portable shooting machine. Uh, it's a product that's a third of the size of traditional shooting machines. Uh, it's much more affordable for the average family, for the average individual, and basically allows people to, you know, put in work wherever they can, whether that's the driveway or the rec center or the gym, um, kind of take control of their training. Yeah, so I started the company when I was 19 years old, uh, out of my garage. I was a basketball player. Me and Brian played AAU basketball together. Um, you know, I, I ended up tearing my ACLs. I had five or four knee surgeries before graduating high school. So I didn't play college ball. Uh, but because of those injuries, I was essentially mad that I couldn't get in the gym and use a shooting machine. Um, so I went from a basketball player to a self-taught mechanical engineer and started developing, you know, a, a shooting machine that can fold down into a duffel bag. Uh, and that was affordable for kids, you know, across the across the country, right? Um, you know, the the vision the vision was always to uh, develop something that uh, was a was an experience, you know, hardware and software that that kids really loved and got immersed with, uh, that tracked your made and missed shots and gamified the whole 
practice and experience and, and really challenge kids around the world. So uh, yeah, the, the portable shooting machine is our first product and, and hopefully we can uh, continue to create great products that, that inspire kids. I think something that, that uh, you know, the reason why Grind exists is, is, you know, primarily, you know, one, we want to inspire kids to, to kind of be great and, and build tools for them to actually be great and accomplish their goals um, in all sports. And then I think secondly, we want to inspire kids that, that kind of come from backgrounds that don't have an engineering, you know, background or business background or marketing background and, and inspire them and, and say, hey, you know, you can do something like this too, right? So um, yeah, that's, that's grinding in a nutshell. I love that. I love the inspiration behind it too. And we didn't make, we didn't, I didn't, we didn't set out to make this a, a basketball startup panel, but it turned out that way. So we went from a space to practice in there, but shit, you got to wear something while you're practicing. So we're going to Natalie and Moolah Kicks. I love what you're doing. Talk to us about what it is, who you are, and why the hell, uh, maybe maybe I don't personally need the shoes, but, but why lots of people, millions of people uh, would benefit from your product. Yeah, absolutely. So my name is Natalie, of course. I'm the founder of Moolah Kicks, which is the first women's basketball sneaker brand. And I'm born and raised in New York City, played my whole life here, travel, AAU, went to Boston College where, you know, I continued to see some of the divisions and the inequalities that divide men's and women's basketball. And one of the things that bothers a lot of women as they start, you know, in first grade, kindergarten, first grade and continue up through college is the fact that every time we lace up to go to practice, we're wearing men's sneakers. We go to buy shoes and we have to shop in the children's or the men's section. And not only does the lack of women's basketball sneakers have a negative social implication that women don't belong within the sport of basketball, but it also has serious performance implications because the foot shape of women is actually different than men in five places. So my brand Moolah Kicks exists to fight for gender equality, make sneakers fit for female ballers, but really to elevate women's basketball as a whole and be a brand that of course is making sneakers that enables players on an individual level to have their top performance, but also on a community level, looking to deconstruct the notion that men's basketball is the standard and looking to elevate the women's game. Let's go like dynamic with it. I love that. Obviously you're polished with that, that pitch. And I, and I, I hope things are going well. We, when we talked, I don't know, six weeks ago, you were about to launch pre-orders. Mm -hmm. How has that gone for you? Cause you, so you, I, I guess you didn't specifically say that, but you don't have an actual physical product today. You are yeah, at the launch stage. Well, you, you do, well, but I, I'm saying, I don't. Oh yeah. You don't. Right. If I bought one, which I did actually, I donated one, but you wouldn't be able to get that product, but you are in pre-launch stage. How has that been going? And what are some things maybe you would have done differently in this sort of pre-launch stage? Yeah, it's going really well. We are getting ready to ramp up into production and we're in conversations with different retailers about having a spot in the fall and in the upcoming year. So overall, really excited for everything that's to come from a accessibility standpoint with our sneaker. But if I were to do anything different, I'm not sure. I mean, I, I think overall the launch went really well and we had a lot of interest. So many people reaching out to us. It's hard to say what we could have done differently because of being a startup. It's always balancing budgets as to what you're spending money on. But of course, if I could, if I had a chance to try anything, I would definitely try doing a lot of different marketing iterations and seeing what's the clearest in the consumer's mind. Gotcha. Interesting. And I know you're still in the thick of it, but I just, you know, as we're yeah. spitballing here, I like that, that, that question as far as like, what would you have maybe thought differently? What about you guys uh, at Grind? You guys got on Shark Tank, one, talk to us about that. But then two, up until that point, wh where to go from ideation prototype to getting on shark tank and what are some things maybe you'd have, you you would have adjusted in that time frame yeah natalie congratulations on the launch that's awesome thank you uh, yeah really cool stuff yeah so so i when i started building the machine uh it took me about five years to launch 
just because it was so so hard to to build and figure out. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, we ended up. I started the company uh, in twenty sixteen. Uh, maybe maybe even a little earlier. I started prototyping, um, but we ended up launching in twenty twenty, like the same month that COVID launched. So that was really interesting. Um, but we, we basically gathered up a whole bunch of interests and, and tried to accumulate a whole bunch of just uh, emails and, and just, you know, really build up almost similar to like a Kickstarter. And we launched uh, March, 2020. We opened up pre-orders. Uh, we took pre-orders for, uh, I don't know, six months, seven months. And then uh, we promised these customers that, it, you know, the product would deliver in a, in a specific time frame. Um, you know, essentially figuring out manufacturing is, is a beast in itself. So we did manufacturing here in the United States and then we, we delivered, uh, you know, batch one all to, to our customers. And during that whole process, it was funny, my fiance just told me I had an email from Shark Tank. She had applied randomly behind my back and we, we yeah, we, we were going through the interview process. <laughs> And uh, they called me down to, to Vegas, um, you know, spent two weeks quarantining. It, it, was, it was great. Like, I don't think I, 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 I uh, uh, perform a, a, a decent pitch without two weeks of quarantine and just write down the walls and practicing my pitch. And uh, yeah, we pitched the Sharks, right? So in the middle of us delivering units, right before we delivered our, our first units. Um, but yeah, it, it, was, it was really, really interesting, really fun. Any, anything you would have done differently in that time frame, like in that five years of starting the product. And I know, like you said, manufacturing is a beast and maybe there's some things you would have looked at, or I don't know, but what are some things, is there anything that you would have shifted in that process? I, know, man. It, I mean, there, there's always things that you could do better. There's always things that you can learn faster, but like everything that I learned throughout the whole process, it, 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 it benefited me in, in some way, shape or form, you know, leading up to getting into tech stars. You know what I mean? It's just raising our round, like all that stuff, just kind of- what accumulated. Talk about what tech stars is. I know, but to anyone who might watch. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, um, so they're, you know, an international VC firm, uh, offices all across the globe. They've got around 52 uh, total now, some of them virtual, but this one is, here in Indy, um, it's a sports focused accelerator. So three months of workshops, mentorship, networking, uh, just, you know, with the end goal of really pushing your business to the next level and culminating in a demo day at the end, which is a live presentation to over 300 investors and just people in the sports industry that, uh, you know, are all interested in your company, interested in, you know, maybe helping you out in some way. So we're really thankful. Techstar has been awesome partners for us. Um, you know, we're two weeks in now, super, super excited about the rest of the program. It's been awesome. Little, little known fact, not a lot of people know this one. Tim and I are one of our first companies that we did. We, it was a follow along workout program app. Is what I, maybe I talked to you about this, Trey. But we, we were in Charlotte where Trey is. We got on a Greyhound bus and, and took it to New York so we could pitch in front of Tech Stars and Nike. Really? Because um, it was like a day notice they announced this thing. And this is like 2013, maybe. Uh -huh. We went up, Tim pitched. Uh, it was more like an informal pitch. Uh, we yeah. didn't get in. Gladly, I guess, at this point, because now we're doing stuff like this. Anyhow. Yeah, exactly. uh, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Trey, anything, I know you're brand new like, like Natalie is. Mm -hmm. Anything you would have adjusted or things you didn't see happening that are happening that would have made things easier along the way? No, nah, I mean, I got to agree on that point. The things I didn't know and was forced to learn throughout the process have just made me so much better as a, you know, entrepreneur, small business owner, startup founder, whatever you want to call it. Um, it's just funny looking back at the days where I knew nothing about how to build an app. I went on Google, went on YouTube, typed in how to build an app. And then you learn about wireframing and you learn about just like all the pieces that you need to just, you know, become a part of it. And um, I just feel like the rest is history from there. It was just a really cool learning experience and you grow. So the only thing I would have done differently is probably brought on um, a coder to my team, like to my team of threes, right? So we're a team of three. 
Um, the, the tech lead that I did bring in, he has project management experience uh, building an app, but that's about it. Um, so we outsourced um, just to build the app. And I really wanted um, something, but it was just kind of like at the moment, it was like a good fit and we just took advantage of the situation. Yeah. And so I know a little bit behind the scenes of, of what you did. And I know you put, I know you didn't code it, but you set it up. You did the wireframe. You did all that stuff, which a lot of people don't do when they get that app perspective. And they're throwing off random ideas and having people put that together for them. So I know that you did that. I saw today, was it today? The Steven Silas head coach of the Rockets is an investor. Talk a little bit about investment. You don't need to say numbers and that sort of deal. I know we've got some big investments on here and then someone who didn't take some investments per se. Uh, so talk about what that, how that came about and why you get a guy like Steven Silas, who is a well-known basketball mind to invest in what you're doing. Right. Um, the basketball world we all know is super small. When you really think about it, I know one person, that person knows somebody. So honestly, just leveraging, you know, my network and, you know, I come from a basketball family. My father played in the league for a amount of time. So we're just one person removed from the head coach of the Rockets. And that could be through any type of connection. So um, we brought him on, on board early in the pandemic. And I feel like if you come from hoops, you understand the problem that we're solving. It's going to be harder to get a guy who doesn't have a sports background to, to want to invest. Um, but I think every person that we've introduced the idea to that has a history in athletics, they understand immediately what we're trying to solve. And it's a no brainer. It's a very simple fix to a widespread solution. So it kind of sells itself. Um, and he just believed in the team and the, in the three guys that we have together. That's awesome. And then you guys at uh, Grind, you guys got obviously gone Shark Tank get an investment. What was the thought process behind doing that Shark Tank wise? Because I mean, you obviously Shark Tank's a, a massive animal in itself and a huge uh, opportunity, but they take a piece of your company, right? So I, was there any thought like, mm, I don't know, fiance did this i'm not happy about it or were you like yo it's, what, when's the next flight to vegas <laughs> i think uh like i grew up watching shark tank right so you know you take the opportunity you know if the opportunity is there you, you it's kind of like you got to shoot your shot like you can't just pass something up like that um whether you, whether you take the deal or not or whether it, you know whatever happens happens right but at the end of the day, you go in with a strategy, with a plan, and, and you know, you kind of go from there, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, that, that was kind of the thought process behind it. We were executing, we were delivering units, we were uh, taking pre-orders, we were running the business, we were figuring out what customer services, <laughs> like, you know, we, we, we were figuring all this stuff out and like Shark Tank was a piece that, that we could leverage and, and we could also leverage what we were doing on the business side. So it was, it was kind of, uh, it, was a, it was a good situation. Yeah. You know? I mean, one thing we knew going in was regardless of how it shakes out on there, it's, you know, the exposure is to what, on average, three to 3.5 to 4.5 million people. So um, not all of them basketball fans, obviously, a lot of them not interested in a $1,700 machine, but still, you know, maybe they have friends, maybe there's going to be a ripple effect. I mean, you know, we, we got contacted by CNBC, for example, they wanted to do a story with us after the episode, um, you know, the hustle, which is a newsletter with 1.5 million subscribers, you know, they also wanted to do one with us. So there's a lot of really cool things that came as a result of it. And even if we hadn't gotten a deal, you know, I think we knew we, we've got this product that people are going to see and they've never really seen before. Um, and so just that awareness was worth, worth it regardless. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. Sure. Natalie, now you don't have big investors like that. You, you've you gone from more of a different perspective on how you're getting revenue, creating crowdfunding, essentially. Yeah, well, I actually, so I did the pre-sales and then I am closing up a, a round of seed investment right now. So I did a mix of both. Yeah. Cool. cool. Mm -hmm. All right. When we talked before, that wasn't, that wasn't out. Anyway, Yeah. But so, so what made you decide to go with the pre-orders, then the round of seed funding? Yeah, I think you just kind of do what you need to do, right? So it's with the opportunities that came from the crowdfunding, it really showed how ready the market was to receive a product like this and not only a women's basketball sneaker, but a brand that is for women's basketball and by women's basketball. So 
being able to get some of that feedback and then say, okay, we can, we have an opportunity to scale this. Let's me show the proof of the brand and the proof of the sneaker and then have that traction to turn around and say, here's why it's worth investing. Yeah. And what a great time to do this, by the way. Like if you'd have done this four years ago, you, you maybe not, you may have not been as received as well received as you are right now, but you're also going against the giants in, in business, right? Name Nike, Adidas, name the names, right? Giants. Did you ever think like, hey, I'm going to pitch this concept to someone like that? Or what made you say, F everybody, I'm coming in and here's what I'm doing. And I'm Natalie White and I don't have $10 million in my bank to throw behind this prototype deal. What made you say, fuck it, I'm doing this shit? Well, I think those brands, there's, they're terrific brands, but they cover so many sports and they're not what we need in women's basketball. It's, it's not the middle market, right? Like women's basketball is very unique as I'm sure you guys know as well. So it's really important that, you know, of course it's well received now, but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't have existed so many years ago that women's basketball has deserved their own everything for so since the day they started playing. And I think that if you have a brand, you know, that is making starts to make women's basketball sneakers, which I hope they will. And I'm sure they will, but when they make one women's basketball sneaker and still a hundred for the men and the very fact that they haven't made women's basketball sneakers in 20 years, that in of itself is a history and a messaging that you don't just come out of, you know, the, the feeling that has been so entrenched in the women's basketball feeling overlooked and underrepresented and then having brands kind of after the NCAA inequalities come out and after certain things, getting them to throw women's basketball a sneaker, that's not a good feeling either. You know, it doesn't feel like, oh, wow, they really care about us. And so the time for what we're looking to do is, is more than that. We're not serving a ton of people and saying, oh, I guess we'll toss one to the women now that Sedona got a popular video. Or this is women's basketball building something that accurately represents us and goes the money and the profits also get fed back into our community and lifting that up. I love that. Yeah. Really uh, cool. Yeah. From a uh, grind, grind fellas, from a, a scalability perspective, what other concepts, distribution, logistics, marketing, have you guys been working on to scale what you're doing? Yeah. 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 Um, you know, we, we've been e-commerce from the jump. I mean, we've been straight Shopify this whole time. And, uh, you know, it's, there's the obvious thing that all of us play basketball, right? Like schools, universities, they have our competitors product in there. They've had them for a while. Um, so that's one opportunity we see to disrupt at least is, is to, you know, get our product into schools, universities, uh, facilities is another place, but, um, you know, really for, for us, a lot of it is getting out of this pre-order phase and just continuing to kind of raise awareness. You know, I mean, there's a lot of people in the individual side that, that can use this machine. And um, <clears throat> I think a, a lot of it is we're so new that there is, you know, an element of like, show me a little more, right? Like, show me that you guys are legit, that you're here to stay. Um, and so we're, we're working on that right now. And then, uh, the, the last piece is our software element is, is we're really going to bring in, you know, a fully uh, virtual experience, uh, personalized recommendations for players based on, you know, what they need to work on, um, trying to gamify that, make it really engaging, really fun for these kids. And, uh, you know, who knows what the end result of that will be, whether we're a training service or a video game, but it'll be somewhere in between. So we're, we're hoping to bring that to market pretty soon. Are you guys trying to go retail? Uh, not, 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 not necessarily. Um, I mean, always had this vision of like walking in the Foot Locker and there's a grind machine there that you can use, mm -hmm. right? And then order online and then we'll ship it to you. Right. But, you know, the, 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 they're still pretty, um, pretty large, you know, pro it's, a, it's a large product, right? It's, it's not yeah. like a shoe box, right? That you can mm -hmm. store you know, a few hundred in the back, right? These are right. pretty big machines, right? So 
we, we definitely have to like be smart and like under, like think of different distribution strategies, kind of like, you know, give one to Nike or give one to, you know, the Adidas store and then you just mm-hmm. walk in and use it and then you can order it there, uh, get it shipped to your house or something, yeah. but not necessarily just kind of have an inventory everywhere. At, at, yeah. No, yeah, it does. I was wondering how big it was because I know you said, you know, it's one of, it's a 30% of the size of a regular basketball return machine. Yeah, which, yeah they're so yeah. expensive, but I didn't know just how big it was. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's about four feet uh, long uh, and a foot and a half wide. So, mm-hmm. you know, it's right. like a long suitcase. Mm-hmm. And would people like keep it at the gym or would they take it with them or would they keep it in their backyard? What's the primary area where people you've seen have interest so we uh most of our customers are are parents at this current point um a lot of them are based in texas so in texas you know there's a lot of trucks (laughs) so so, you know we've had plenty of parents put it in the back of a truck and take it from the driveway to the local park where there's a there's a place to set it up take it to the rec center um you know that really is kind of what we were going for is we want people to use it where they can right? Yeah. Thomas was locked out of the gym, you know, 5 a.m. trying to put in work when he got the idea, right? Like, we're trying to eliminate that. Like, if a kid wants to work out at 5 a.m. or 11 p.m., if he's got a hoop and he's got a ball and he's got a grind machine, then he can take it there. Yeah, yeah. you literally roll it out of your garage or, if you know, you got to, it'll fit in the backseat of the car. Mm-hmm. It'll, it'll fit How in heavy the, is it? It's about 100 pounds right now. Okay. So we're working on trying to reduce that. I mean, the, the vision was always like literally throw it over your shoulder like a like a duffel bag, right? And, and it just takes time there, right? You like whenever your phones came out or the first iPod came out, the things were huge, right? And then now eventually, you know, it's it's it, they, they get tiny and and now it's just on your phone, right? So mm-hmm. it's just, you know, we're we're really trying to iterate and and constantly get get better uh, over yeah. time. No, I guess that also makes sense. I mean, in places, right? I'm in New York City. I don't know where you guys grew up. Um, there's no space here. You grew up in the city too? Yeah, we were both we're both from Houston. We were uh, high school high school teammates back in the day. In Texas? Yeah, yeah. Nice. Well, in you know, here in New York, I guess you're not dragging them onto the subway to go to the gym, but there's <laughs> also no space to have right. those big machines. Um, right. There is like the top gym I was in last night Brooklyn Post there's not room to hold the big machines that you guys are talking about so you know you guys know better than I do but I'm sure it's some of the markets here even though people can't load them onto trucks the gyms because they're have no space in them they'd probably love a product that takes up 30 percent of the space yeah we actually have a lot of customers in New York New York's a big market yeah 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 no I mean it's uh the 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 real benefit to the product is, you know, if, if you want to have three of them or two of them, right. In the same kind of location, then like take a high school, for example, right. Like a lot of the time you'll have a, a really large shooting machine and there's multiple programs. There's the boys and the girls program. Each boys and girls program has several teams. Yeah. Varsity is using the machine or well, the JVs definitely not going to get access to that. Yeah. <laughs> they're, not, they're, they're not getting on the machine until the varsity's done not happening and so uh you know it's better for them to have several machines so that everyone can be putting in the work and it's you know at our price point it's it's honestly like a it's a no-brainer right you can yeah get big time bars, four of ours for the same price and so if you're allowing most of your program to get in some work then that helps and just the last piece is, you know, some of our competitors don't even fit through a standard door. And in, in yeah. so if you're transporting from gym to gym, just on the same facility, it can be cumbersome. Whereas ours is, I mean, fits through whatever door you right. can find. So. Hi, hi says in the, in the Q and A thing, Jimbo should have an upcharger offering to use grind at its spaces. Nice brand collab. I'm not mad at that. Mm-hmm. Ah. <laughs> One. I love, Talk it. I love it. Hey, hey guys, <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. I have a hard stop at 4.30, so I'm jumping. Brian's going to stay, but Trey and Natalie, it was great to meet y'all. It Good really, to meet you, really too. And I'm going to reach out. Like, Absolutely. Really kind of what you guys are doing.
Sounds good. You too. All right. Appreciate you joining us. I'll connect you guys here on, on emails yeah. after this. Trey, yeah. how do you scale what you're doing? I know right now the focus is Charlotte. You've got seven spots, mm -hmm. right? Seven places on mm -hmm. board. How do you scale what you're doing and time frame wise? Or when are you trying to do all this? Right. Um, what I've said from the beginning is if it can work in one city, it can work in 10 cities. If it can work in 10, it can work in 100, right? But like, how do you get there? Um, and I think for us, our focus is just to bring enough value to the Charlotte area so that other people see like the potential of like how to scale it, right? We need people to believe in it, but in order for them to believe in it, it has to work locally. So if we bring value to these seven facilities, and we're going to hopefully expand to about 10 um, over the next couple of months, um, but we really just want to get that, uh, the product experience, the flow of everything, we want it to work, right? And then once we do that, um, we are hopefully looking at another seed round, and then we'll have enough money to kind of get the runway to, okay, expand to an Atlanta and expand to, a, you know, Orlando and, you know, these other big basketball hubs in the Southeast. Because um, a lot of our overhead is really just going to be marketing dollars, right? Getting users to know about the platform. Because on the facility side, if you're a host, it's free to sign up. We're taking a small percentage um, if you look at the numbers. So it, the host side, it's like almost every time we've reached out to a host, we've had a positive conversation. So scaling the facilities won't be that hard, but scaling the users, getting brand recognition is going to be the important part. Hmm. You're, on You're muted. I, I got that. I got that now. now. I've only done five of these today. Like I didn't. <laughs> anyway, uh, Natalie, how, how do you plan to scale? And what are some next steps with Moolah Kicks? A uh, next step is to hit this next season really hard, right? I mean, scaling for us means getting them on as many feet as possible and having he getting top high school players heads turning, asking what shoes they're wearing. When you when I get them on the feet of these players there's been nothing but positive responses because they've never worn a women's basketball shoe. So it's, I mean, you guys can probably imagine if you were, if you had sneakers that you were playing in your whole life that felt like flat on the bottom and boxes on your feet. And then you wore sneakers that they have on the market for you guys. Now you put them on, you would say, Oh my God, these feel awesome. Um, of course yeah. I want to wear them. And I think the key for us is to actually physically get them in the hands of as many people, whether they're playing or just trying them on, as many people as possible, because once they really put them on, that's when they'll feel that difference and we'll be able to grow. How are you doing that now? And have you got it on some of the big names? Like yeah, the, like the yeah, I mean, it's nice the world I'm here in New York and I know I'm biased. You guys are in some good basketball towns too, but a lot of people were all through New York for different tournaments. So I just went to the Queen Me best basketball player in New York. I used to play for all those teams here, Gaucho's Exodus, New Heights. So getting, going back to those programs and having the, some of those girls wear them, test them out and having their sentiments as well as they share it on Instagram, all that stuff's been really important. Have how you was, had, uh, go ahead. You go I, was, I, I was just, I'm curious, Natalie, like how was the development of the shoe um, kind of what was like the impetus for you to like, was it your own discomfort wearing uh, what was traditionally designed like men's shoes or um, where did this kind of come from this idea to to adjust it to the specifics of a woman's a woman's foot yeah it was I started the company because I just thought it was so messed up that you have to walk into the store and like if you guys were forced to wear women's sneakers every time you played basketball like it would not fly named mm, after sure. a woman you know like every time yeah. like I understand maybe maybe once but if it if you didn't have any other choice like you eventually would get fed up with it and so I started it for that reason and then mm -hmm. as I was looking into actually making the sneakers the first thing you need to do is develop a last which is the inner foot form so I can kind of show you what that looks like this is basically what's on the inside of every single sneaker Mm -hmm. that's made of moolah and other sneakers they pull the materials over this last and so why it's different is because women's lasting and this was made just for moolah but have higher arches a wider ball of the foot your pinky toes lower down your heel is slimmer so all of those factors kind of come together on the on the last which then is reflected when you actually put the sneaker on so i think a couple of things. I started it because of that social reason. But when I went to actually make the sneaker, I said, oh my gosh, 
there's a huge performance and injury implication as well because of course when your feet aren't supported you're gonna blow out your knee and your ankle and all that stuff so it was it was the social and then I said oh my god the performance is like almost unethical that people haven't been making these (laughs) yeah no that's awesome and, really and cool. more, more girls have ACL issues than boys. And I don't know if it's directly connected. By to far. It's hard to say. It's not connected when you talk about those things. Exactly. It probably is hard to prove at the same time. But, but it, I mean, right. anecdotal evidence seems, seems fairly clear. Have you had in, in you know, I, when I found out about you, I don't know, maybe it was Ari Chambers who had tweeted something maybe from Bleacher Report. And she also started to highlight her, which is Bleacher Report. And then you did a takeover. And, and I've seen you uh, or the brand a bunch yeah. of different places. How many people have reached out to you? Has there been any like crazy ones where they're like, hey, I want to invest? And that could be from just a, a, a general business perspective or athletes where you're like, holy shit, Sue Bird just DM me. Probably not yeah, Sue I get, so, so I get a ton of, I get a lot of emails actually of like individuals saying they want to invest and, and all that stuff. I say, you know, we're not really taking that. But I also get emails saying, you know, are these sneakers being, how are they being like, are they being made by children? And I'm like, no, they're not. So there's a lot of, you know, junk email. You can't necessarily take all of it to heart, but I was featured on a lot of awesome accounts, women's slam, highlight her, um, like footwear news, sneaker freaker, all of those Boston globe, like all the TV stations up there. So it's been a really good experience from a PR perspective. I haven't had anyone huge reach out to me necessarily. Definitely some WNBA players, All of them are contracted up, of course. So with it being a sneaker brand, it's not something that people can easily promote if they have outstanding contracts, but it is something that I've gotten a lot of WNBA players reaching out to me and saying they do believe in it and they're excited for it. Mm. So so how soon can my sister get a pair? She plays at uh, Florida Gulf Coast. Oh my God, great school. I'll ship them down to Florida once I get some. If she's a 10 and a half or a seven and a half or a nine, we have those on hand in big women. Feet. She's got big feet. <laughs> what size is she? Oh, she's a, uh, she's a 12 and a half. So in, in men's or women's in women's. Okay. Nice. Okay. Yeah. We're going to have up to size 15 in the fall. So, oh, wow. Yeah. Great. What'd you say? This season should be able to have them. Yeah. This season she'll, she'll cop a pair right in the yeah. fall. And uh, yeah, we have some, some really, tall girls the i've had a couple of size 15 requests so wow. got to get those on them yeah it's it's also good timing with name image likeness and college athletes being able to do some mm-hmm. different sorts of things the timing of this really really fits well uh, we should continue to have conversations you and i and us type deal yeah offline around some of the stuff but trey what do you think is success we got like five more minutes here to a couple more things here what mm-hmm. what, what what makes the the app what qualifies for you five, 10 years down the line being a successful app? Whew, I mean, five, 10, that's a, that's a way different question. Or a year from <laughs> Yeah. No, that's right. Right. What, what is success for me, right? A year, there five, and 10. That's... I know, I know. Um, so actually we, we ended up getting a meeting with some YMCA execs, like high level YMCA execs. And that's a space that I did not even see as competing or touching anytime soon, right? I saw them as a direct competitor. And if we could get on the same side as like institutional workout spaces to where they're using us, I think that would be a huge win. Um, so one, another one in particular is like the parks and rec systems, like Charlotte in particular, super dated. If you want to reserve a rec gym, you go through pen and paper, you're going through the facilities manager and you got a call or a text or email. It's just really dated. So if we could align with like institutional um, you know, facilities and that infrastructure and they're using us because we're helping them. I think that's a win. And we're taking, you know, we could do something where we even lower the percentage per booking if we're getting, you know, autonomy over all their booking. So that's, that's a huge win for us. Trey, I, think sorry, that- I, I also have a question for Trey, if you don't mind. So can, yeah, can anyone Go. sign up to like an Airbnb? I know you use that terminology when you're explaining it can i say i run a gym i don't but say i own a moolah gym and someone just canceled for practice can i list that gym space or do does someone at gimbal have to like coordinate a contract between the gym or can any individual list a gym in a time that it's open right right so at first we're going to keep it small but you know as we expand 
anybody that has a facility is going to be able to list their space and they have full autonomy over their hours, just like Airbnb. Obviously, you have to get approved, but um, that's that's our goal. Okay. So, yes, you could do that with Moolah Gym. Okay. Can't wait. Yeah, right. <laughs> the <laughs> hypotheticals. What, what would success be to you, Brian? Man, I mean, success for us is uh, – it really is creating a new way for kids to, to train for basketball and, you know, reach the next level. Like we want it to be something that's super fun. Um, you know, we want to reimagine a lot of these current, current training methods, like by athletes for athletes is kind of the way that we like to look at it. Right. Like both Thomas and I, you know, and Natalie and Trey, like we all kind of grew up in this space, right? Like it's a huge part of your life. And uh, I think everyone's got their own opinion. It's like how to improve that experience and that journey. So we're trying to leave an imprint on that um, and really just close the gap in accessibility to this technology, you know, and uh, provide access to as many people as we can and really just help all these kids, you know, <clears throat> be inspired about doing stuff other than basketball. You know, they show them that, you know, basketball is, is one path, but uh, the NCAA likes to say, if you, you know, 99% of people don't make it. And it's like, we want you to know, like, you can make it regardless of whether you make the NBA. Like, if you make it as a lawyer, if you make it as an entrepreneur or engineer, you know, you still made it, right? So um, those are kind of our metrics for success and hopefully some nice business prosperity comes down the way. Look, we're four different athletes. You guys are, I guess, if you include Thomas, five athletes. Trey's the only one who's made a dollar playing a sport. But we're all in and around this space of, of a sport because of our passion behind it and the things that we've mm -hmm. done. And, and, you know, like it, it most people are not going to play pro sports and make money. So sure. opportunities like that. So I love that. What about you, Natalie? What is success to Moolah Kicks? Success looks like more opportunity in women's basketball and more money in women's basketball, period. Everything, right? We're looking to be a changing body for the entire sport. And I think the biggest is I want people to start appreciating women's basketball. I want women's basketball players to start appreciating themselves for what they do and not how they stack up to the men because I said it, you know, earlier, but no matter if it's in a positive way or in a negative way, we, sit, we only judge and care about women relative to how they are to men. So we'll say, oh, she, they, I don't like women because they can't dunk. Or they'll say, she's so good because she plays just like Steph Curry. And I think in either regard, you're saying that men's basketball is the standard that women should be held to. And what we're trying to do is in order to actually elevate women's basketball, we need to get away from that comparison and we need to start to create, I mean, I have a lot of opinions on, you know, how that should be done. There's a lot of issues currently already, but there's, it starts really with things that whose sole and top priority is women's basketball so that you don't, we kind of cut that comparison a little bit. And in the end, what success looks like is, more basketball sneakers on the shelves for women, Moolah, but also other brands like getting their attention and having them having competing brands is actually a huge success for Moolah and opening up the space yeah. and also having more signature sneakers from athletes, more money that's going into player sponsorships and like three on three tournaments with crazy prize money, just a different culture around women's basketball is what we're looking to create. I love that. And you're going to do it. That's already starting to happen. The, the shift, like I said, the timing with what you're trying to do is so perfect with all this. You mentioned Sedona and the stuff that happened there and all of the momentum after that. Like there's, it's such a great time to do this. But anyhow, we've taken enough time of all yours. We appreciate it. You guys are all great in what you're doing. And I'm, I'm glad we were able to connect here. 